Thanks very much, Nadine, and, and thanks to the other speakers um, for providing a diverse range of talks and quite a nice sort of segue into this talk. Um, so we've heard a little bit today about um, natural flooding and also a few talks on floodplain watering and um, artificial floodplain inundation. What I'm going to do in this talk is use um, some freshwater fish data to compare ecological response to natural flooding um, and engineered floodplain inundation. Um, but before I get stuck into the data, I really think that it's worth setting sort of the ecological context for this study, um, as, as well as the management and geographical. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on that. And really, probably going back to freshwater ecology 101, I want to talk about how river, rhine, floodplain ecosystems function. And so really the, the processes and patterns that we see in river, rhine, floodplain ecosystems are de determined by two main things, connectivity, and the flow regime. And the flow regime creates disturbance and diversity. And in a regulated river, we, we simplify the flow regimes and we fragment the river. So we put weirs or dams on rivers or we extract water and we simplify the flow regime. And what that does is decreases habitat complexity. It also decreases productivity. And ultimately, it decreases biodiversity. And there's a stack of literature on the impacts of river regulation on aquatic ecosystems. There's seminal books like Jeff Petzer's early 80s book, and there's some really good review papers, um, particularly in the 2000s. And what these, this research and these reviews give us is really some knowledge of the mechanisms by which river, re river regulation impacts aquatic ecosystems. But probably more than that, it gives us the knowledge on what we need to restore to restore ecosystem function and health. So we're talking about the Murray-Darling Basin today in southeastern Australia, and unfortunately it has the dubious honour of being one of the most heavily regulated and fragmented um, river basins in the world, and we're all quite well aware of the impact of this on aquatic ecosystems in the basin. If we focus down on fish now, which is the thing I get into, as well as frogs, and, and it was nice to see a bird talk. Um, no, I'm serious about that. It's good to see some bird ecology. It's, it's really good. Um, anyway, fish, um, worldwide, you can pretty, sim pretty much simplify it. R river regulation disadvantages native fish and advantages invasive or exotic species. And in the Murray-Darling Basin, native fish populations are estimated to be about 10% of their pre-European levels. And the primary cause of this decline is river regulation. Dams, weirs, water extraction, habitat modification, and fragmenting habitats. And at the same time that native fish have declined, invasive species like common carp have prospered. So today I'm going to be talking about the Chowler region, um, which is on the South Australian border in the Lower River Murray. And when I talk about the Lower River Murray, I'm essentially talking about the River Murray downstream of the Darling Junction. And we all know that we've heard that the flow regime in the Lower Murray is fundamentally altered. And about 27% of annual natural flow gets to the river mouth. But as well as the flow regime being altered, one of the key things that changed is that the physical template of the river in the lower rivers change. So this plot here is a longitudinal profile along 2,000 kilometres of the River Murray. The lower 1,000 kilometres is constrained by a series of locks and weirs. So it's essentially changed what was a free-flowing river into a series of lake-type habitats under low flows. Yet the remaining 1,000 kilometres of the river, it's sort of upstream of Mildura, is still a free-flowing habitat. So for a given volume of water coming down the river, the ecological response in this free-flowing habitat can be quite different from the weir pools. And just to explain this, up here we've got a natural stream which has got a natural gradient. It's got some wood and rocks in it. Down here we've got a regulated river. We've got a weir sitting in it. Just imagine these have both got the same volume of water flowing down them. This one's got a range of velocities. It's got hydraulic complexity. It's got water moving around these snags and rocks. This one where we put the weir in, the water's backed up. It slows down. It's a lot simpler. You've got less of a range of velocities and lower velocities. And the ecological function 
and the patterns that we see in these two systems are fundamentally different. In the lower River Murray, in the main stem, we used to get riverine mussels, River Murray crayfish and Murray cod. And those animals have essentially been replaced by wetland mussels, yabbies, another wetland type species, and fish like carp. One of the few places where there still is flowing water habitat is in the, in the Chowler Anabranch system. And the Anabranch at Chowler flows around Lock 6 here, which has a three metre head differential. So the creeks that flow into Chowler Creek dissipate that head and have flowing water. That's what one of these habitats looks like and it's really important for these riverine fish. But at the same time, Chowler's is important because of these habitats. There's a whole lot of habitats at Chowler that have become degraded. And River Red Gum is a really good example of this. And the black box, lack of overbank flooding, and also a rising saline groundwater table. So the degradation of um, overstory vegetation was recognised at Chowler. Um, and in the early 2000s, the Murray-Darling Basin Commission introduced the Living Murray program and it set out some objectives for overstory vegetation. And it put a whole lot of money behind interventions to protect that overstory vegetation. It's a bit of a pity at that time there weren't objectives for fish, but now there are objectives for fish there. There are a range of options explored to try and maintain vegetation health and area. Um, and the option that was settled on was to build a, a weir or a regulator on Chowler Creek. Um, and when that weir was to be operated, it had stop logs put in it and you could backwater up behind that weir to inundate the floodplain. It's not a permanent weir, like the weirs on the River Murray. It's left open most of the time and intermittently it will have the logs put in it. And it looks very much like a weir on the River Murray. It's Chowler Creek to Big Creek, so it's a similar thing. And it's got a whole lot of ancillary structures so that when you use the weir in the creek, the water doesn't go flowing around it on the floodplain. So when it's used, it fundamentally alters flow in that creek. And if you look at the, the ecological rationale and some of the empirical data, you would say, well, how do you restore an ecosystem using something that's caused damage to an ecosystem? And I suppose this has raised you know, a fair bit of discussion and a fair bit of commentary on the notion of using regulators. There's a few papers published over the last few years um, sort of reviewing the approach. Um, it may maintain the health, or well, these authors thought it may maintain the health of overstory vegetation, but it carries substantial risks. And it might not ultimately restore the processes that are required for these ecosystems. Coming back again to fish, um, specifically there was risk assessments done for fish and frogs and birds. The fish risk assessment said a similar thing, that regulators simplify habitats, they cause fragmentation, and they can be decoupled from the riverine hydrograph. And this may cause impacts um, for native fish, um, but benefit carp. So the Chowler regulator was um, constructed and tested in spring 2014. Water levels were raised 2.7 metres, <coughs> Um, behind the regulator over about a three month period and discharge was increased through Chowler Creek to try and maintain some of these flowing water habitats for native fish. The use of the regulator gave us an opportunity to look at fish assemblages and some of the floodplain habitats that were inundated. And what was great was we looked at these same habitats during the 2010-11 floods. So I'm going to look at three sites, uh, Wurtawurt, Limbra and Punka Horseshoe. And so we've got data from those two periods. The floods were 90,000 megalitres a day, large scale flooding of the floodplain for, and for hundreds of thousands of kilometres. The regulator was operated at 10,000 mega day, which is a within channel flow. We set the same um, suite of gear in these floodplain lakes during both times, um, fight nets and multi-panel gill nets, so the same level of effort. I'll just talk a little bit about the fish assemblage. So in this MDS we can see two clear groupings. We can see the fish assemblages in the lakes during regulator operation group out together and the fish assemblages during flooding in those same lakes group out together as well. 
And I'll use some pictures to show you why you get these groupings. During the floods, we caught a diverse range of fish in these lakes. We caught a diverse range of native fish. <coughs> Thanks, Sorry. Debbie. Does that take two minutes? No worries. Um, we caught juvenile golden perch. We caught large, high abundances of these small-bodied native fish as well. But we also caught carp. During the regulator operation, we caught carp, and we caught lots of carp. This is the catch out of one fight net of juvenile carp, and I think this one fight net took Chris and I several hours to process. And if we look at the data from the flood and the regulator operation, for native fish, high abundances of these small-bodied species and a diverse range of fish during the regulator operation, quite low abundances of native fish and decreased diversity. The really big change is carp, 120,000 juvenile carp during regulator operation, 370 during the flooding. We can also look at the density of carp in these habitats and we, we sort of estimated the area that a fight net might fish and then multiplied that up by average fight net catch. During flooding, really consistent densities. During regulator operation, wide variation, but up to a million fish per hectare. And if each of these fish weighs about a gram, that's a thousand kilos of carp in a hectare. There's been some work with juvenile carp to suggest that these fish may be having ecosystem impacts at greater than 175 kilos per hectare. So young and fear carp, do these fish recruit into a bit older age groups? We normally see at Chowler that after high in-channel flow events or floods, we see increases in young of year recruitment. During low flow periods, there's very little. In 2015, after the regulator event, we've got low flow period, but we've got higher abundances of young of year carp. And what we're also wondering now is do these fish actually disperse to other areas? And one of the ways we're looking at that is we're looking at the odalus, the ear bones of these fish, and trying to find a chemical fingerprint for the Chowler region, and then we can go catch carp in other regions and see if they have that Chowler fingerprint. So in conclusion, it's pretty stark. There were substantial differences between the flood and the regulator fish assemblages. The regulator really did benefit common carp um, and even the small body native fish which we thought might respond to those wetland habitats didn't. We still really don't know much about impacts on ecosystem function. Um, and the longer term impacts on regional population dynamics. Overall, I think if you look at the ecological theory and you look at the data, these floodplain regulators are big experiments and we hear a lot of talk about adaptive management um, and whether it's for risks or benefits, to do adaptive management properly, you really need hypothesis driven research, which has been a little lacking to date. And at times it's gonna have to be long term research. This is the Chowler regulator. We've got another two big regulators pl planned for the South Australian floodplain and Victoria's got a hold on on the cards. What's gonna be the cumulative effects of these regulators? Benefits and potential impacts. Thanks. <coughs>